Yes. This evening, <laughs> can't tell with all the smoke. <laughs> yeah, you know that one. Okay. Uh, Romans chapter 5. <clears throat> I wanted to mention is, you know, the ministry is not an organization. It's about people living out the gospel and the effects of them growing in their lives day to day. That's what the ministry is. Beyond that, um, and that's really our responsibility, and that's why we, we study the scriptures in a way, and my intention when I do this is, is that I can teach you guys so that you can do it yourselves in your own lives. The point is that you pass it on and that it's it's working out. That's really what the ministry is. Not this big structure and you got to have the bishop and so on and so forth, that kind of thing. Um, that's what this is all about. So that's why we get into to this and, and, and the point is to change our lives. And obviously to give us eternal life. That's the big thing, you know. Um, so we'll open up in a word of prayer, okay? Heavenly Father, we uh, thank Thee for another day of grace. We thank Thee for the opportunity to gather around Your Word and to study it uh, without fear of reprisal and, and, uh, and, and threats of, of harm. Uh, we have a great privilege uh, to study Your Word. We ask that Your Holy Spirit would uh, really open up our eyes to things uh, tonight uh, and, uh, and that it strengthen and stabilize us as You've designed it to be. In Jesus' name. Okay, so Romans chapter 5, the first 11 <coughs> verses of Romans chapter 5, J.C. O'Hare used to say are the most important verses in the Bible for a new believer. And we're going we're gonna to go and read through that right now, actually. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have. I always stop there because it always strikes me. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have. We've got something. Not, we didn't just get saved. We didn't just get eternal life. We have, as a present possession right now, we have a whole bunch of things. And Paul's going to go through it. Watch. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into His grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope, in the glory of, of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath to come through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we join God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the atonement. There is so much there, it's going to take us several weeks to get through that. Um, and I know some of, the, some of the verbiage for some of you is going to look, what? <laughs> so don't worry, we'll, we'll go through it and it'll start to make a lot of sense. Now, what happens in chapter 5 is Paul says, therefore, based on, he starts off, you notice that the word there, therefore. The, the point of therefore is, I've just explained a whole bunch of things to you. Now that I've explained it and you understand, therefore, right, there's a conclusion, therefore, this. All right. So Paul says, now that I've gone through um, in chapter 3 and chapter 4, I went through how you're saved through faith and, and how you're justified in Christ. Remember, let's go back just uh, real quick to Romans chapter 3. 
We spent so much time on Romans chapter 3, verse 20, 21. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest and being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. The righteousness of God now, I'm just kind of a little review, the righteousness of God now is being uh, shown on the believer, not through laws, not through he having to do things. You have to be good, you have to try, you have to try hard, you, have to, uh, you know, it's not a, a thing of the law, and it's not even something you've done, it is, it is by faith of Jesus Christ. So Christ dying on the cross, doing the complete work on the cross and offering it as a free gift to go, I'm, I've done it. Not only have I done it, but there's a whole, we're going to go into, there's a whole thing that I'm doing. A whole bunch of things that I've, I'm going to do. And it's unto all and upon all them that believe. By simple faith. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We went through chapters 1 and 2, and it's the first thing in chapters 1 was there's not that the world is depraved. Ends off going, they're reprobate. Who doesn't know that? Mm -hmm. Turn on the news. The world's a messed up place. And then there's those that say, yeah, but you know, I'm a good guy. Chapter 2, I'm pretty good. I'm a religious guy, you know, and, and I should get into heaven. I mean, you know. And he goes, <laughs> what's he say in, in, in chapter 2? It was chapter 2, 6. I believe it is, um, in chapter 2, 5. So the, 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 the religious guy says, you know, but I, I don't need salvation. I'm a pretty good guy. I'm going to get into heaven, you know, if I do, do the right thing. And he says, but after thy, thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render every man according to his deeds. He says, I'm going to be even madder at you. You're going to even have more wrath. Because you sit there and think that you're so much better than everybody else. And then you had the Jew. The Jew said, oh, you know, the Jew said, I've got the law. I'm, I'm a descendant of Abraham, and I've done all this kind of good stuff. And, you, you know, I'm going to heaven. <laughs> My father's Abraham. I, we're the holy nation, aren't we? <laughs> and he says, no. He says, in fact, the law just proved <clears throat> that you were a sinner. And what he does here, back to chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God put everybody on the same level and says, Listen, folks, you've all sinned. You all need a Savior. Back in chapter 2, he said, But if you had been perfect, if you had lived your life and not done one single sin, what would have happened? You'd have gone straight into heaven. <laughs> okay, so the whole room is out of that. <laughs> One sin in your own. <clears throat> James said if you break one point of the law, you've broken it all. So it doesn't matter. Why? Where, where do we meet God? You know, they all, everyone starts to talk about God as law. But where do you meet God? Does anyone Justice. remember? On his what? His justice. The idea of when where we meet God is at his justice, not at his love. Because if it was at his love, okay. <coughs> you can't have perfect love without being just. Imagine as a parent, you got two children, and you say, you know what? Love both my children, but I love that one more. When they do wrong, I just kind of forget about it. But that one, I'm gonna hold it. That's not love. So you can't have perfect love without justice. If you're in, if you're unjust, you're not loving. You're just playing favorites, and that makes you guilty of a wrong. So what happens with God is we meet Him on the level of His justice, and He goes, <laughs> God says, I can't, I can't tolerate sin. I can't tolerate anything but perfection. And in fact, he can't even look on it. He's got to turn his head away. When Christ bore all the sin of the world on the cross. God the Father turned his head. And you can imagine the son sitting there and goes, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? He just couldn't even understand that 
the amazing feeling there of having the entire world against you. They've just crucified you. They, they beat you. They rejected you. And then the only one that you have been with for all of eternity turns around. That's lonesome. <laughs> You know, that's lonesome. Being just, verse 24, being justified freely by His grace. We're justified freely. Nothing that we've done. We trust in what Christ did for us. Why? Because we couldn't do it. We're guilty. You can, remember I told you the other night about the, the little Asian boys. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I've told everyone that. Justice. There was a story about two Asian boys, their parents had died, and the older boy, he, uh, he took on to, to take care of the younger brother. But the younger brother was a rascal. He was into problems all the time. And he was always getting into trouble, and he, was, he had trouble with the law, and so on and so forth. And the, the older brother, he lived with them, and he just, he tried everything. Um, but the younger brother just, just was rebellious. And one night, the younger brother came bolting through the front door, running up the stairs, and the older brother said, what's wrong? What is going on here? And the brother goes upstairs, and he starts to go up, and he hears the sirens behind him. And he goes, oh, what has he done now? And he goes up to the washroom, and he sees that the younger brother has taken off a blood-soaked T-shirt. And he's threw it in the hamper. And his brain starts racing, racing. And he takes that t-shirt, takes his off, puts it on, and the cops bust through the door at that point in time. God. They look very much alike. And he had the bloody t-shirt. So they arrested him. He went to court. He was convicted. The younger brother didn't say a word. Then they convict, they sentenced him to die. The younger brother didn't say a word. Time went on. He waited for his, for his sentence to be carried out. The brother, not a word. Then the day they executed him, the brother, the younger brother was there. He saw his older brother get executed for what he had done. Not a word. A year or two later, it had been eating at him terribly. And he just couldn't take it anymore. <clears throat> and he went to the district attorney and he said, I've got a confession to make. And uh, he said, what's that? He said, it wasn't my brother that killed that man, it was me. And the district attorney said, I can't convict two men of the same crime. Your brother paid the price. I can't convict you. And now he's dead. I can't overturn the conviction. So you're free to go. Your brother paid for it. The issue of justice is that it, cannot, it could never accused, sentenced two men for what one man had done. And that's the idea when God, when God, when Christ died on the cross, that he paid that price, and by you trusting in that, he can't convict you. You're justified. Look at that. Verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption Where's the redemption from that is in Christ Jesus? Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. God not only saved, saved you today, He saved every man in the past who had trusted Him. Whatever message or word that was given to that man in time past, He says, through the for, He said, to declare for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. God had a forbearance program that he carried for all of time past. And he said, when he died on the cross and he rose again, he said, all those men that trusted me, even though they didn't know what they trusted in, they're justified. Freely. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No. It's not your works that gets that, that you can brag on. See, if you were saved by works, you could brag all the time. Well, you know, I'm such a good guy. I, 
I lived and I did all this and I did all the sacrifices and I did everything I was supposed to do and I'm perfect. He says, where's Bozo? He says, none. He says, what, if you follow the law? Nay. But by the law of faith, we can boast in the faith and what Christ did. That him that I boast, what, what's that hymn, what's the worst of that hymn I'm thinking? Um, Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my Lord. That's, uh, you know, I love that song, but anyhow. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Do you know what the world teaches? You can go right across the street to that church over there. And they'll tell you, wear the suit, put on the tie, everybody gets married, everybody has a family, this is the way you live, da da da, and if you do it our way, you're going to go into heaven. That's called works of the law. They don't even believe that. What they believe is, oh yeah, that's, that's nice, you know, and if you hold it up, it'll keep away the va vampires. <laughs> pretty, much, pretty much it. Right? That's what they're going to do. And, but we're justified by faith without that is in absence, apart from, I can do nothing, and I'm justified. So I go through, that's my justification. That's losing. They, from verse 21 to 28, that is the gospel of grace. Right there. Romans chapter 4. We're justified because of that. So, not only did Christ save you once, some folks, what they do is they, they trust Christ as Savior, and then they go back to the law, Galatians. The Galatians had a real problem with that. Paul said, are you, are you nuts? <laughs> like, you're saved by grace, and now you're going to work your way into heaven? You're going to make yourself a better person? The issue, and I hear so many believers do that, and they'll say, you know, I, I'm saved, but I, I'm going to make myself a better person. You want to see someone fail? Those are the people who fail all the time. Because they said, I couldn't save myself, but now I can. What? No. If you could have done that, he wouldn't have died on the cross. Why bother coming down to earth and dying on the cross if there was any way that you could have done it? You're not making yourself a better person even after you're sick. So you're justified apart from the law. The law never comes in. You trusted Christ as Savior. You rested in the finished work of the cross. And now you're resting in what he's doing inside of you as well. In chapter 5, so Paul goes through there and he goes, Therefore... I've told you a whole bunch of stuff. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have. I, that excites me when I read that. <laughs> Therefore, being justified by faith, I have. I have something. I, I'm already justified by faith, but I have a whole bunch of stuff now. Didn't know that. I have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That whole chapter, we'll come back to this, that whole chapter, or, or verses 1 to 11, the theme constantly going through is rejoicing. Look at verse 2. By whom we also have access by faith into his grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope. Verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation. Verse 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The issue with what God has given us once we're saved, what we have is joy, is rejoicing. We have that. Because it's no longer about me having to do something and all my... There's not a person in this room, I'm sure, that can't look in the mirror and say, I, I fail, I fail. I fail. And if you don't, you just fail there, right there. So. <laughs> Rejoice. We have peace with God. You know, the religious system never lets you in on having peace with God, does it? It always says, 
but you need to do this. And the first time you mess up, what's it say? You're a failure. You've got multiple personalities. You've got some sort of mental... You know, sin has gotten down to a mental health condition. Did you, did you realize that today? Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the results of sin... Now, can sin cause mental health conditions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay? Drugs can cause mental health position, uh, conditions. But, but the problem is that it's all got convoluted at this point where... It's, you don't say a man who committed a bunch of murders is evil anymore. We used to say he, there was wickedness. It was spiritual wickedness. What do you say? He's sick. He's sick. Right? I even found myself saying, oh, man, that guy's sick. <laughs> no, 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 that's not the issue. He might be sick. But, but that's the cart after the horse. The horse is that he has a sin nature and he decided, I'm not going to restrain it. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. You want to create some mental conditions? Start hearing voices in your head and so on and so forth. When you start to believe that you are defective. Now for the world, do they have anything else but that? Remember, remember the chart that said that... In, in time past, we had no hope. If you're not, you see, look at verse 1 again. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have. So therefore, if you're not justified by faith, what do you got? Nothing. You don't have. You're without. <coughs> right? Ephesians chapter 2. Let's, hold your hand there. We're coming back. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> Verse 11. Wherefore, remember that in time past, Gentiles in the flesh. What? <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't want to go to verse 11. Go to verse 2. Verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. He says the world is dead. Spiritually dead. How? In trespasses and sins. They have no way out. All they do is they create mechanisms and tools for themselves to try to deal with it. And they try to, yeah, i got to learn this little tool and that little tool and this self-help book and that, da, da, da. And, and, and they have to because what? They've got nothing else. That's all they got. If you haven't trusted Christ as your personal Savior, you've got nothing but what you've got in your body. And Paul says, it's dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein? In time past, you walked according to the course of this world. He said, in time before you were saved, you walked in the same way the rest of the world walk, walks. According to the prince of the power of the air. You know who that character is? Satan. Satan? Prince of the power of the air. Nasty cuss. <laughs> the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Among whom also we all had our conversation in time past. In the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. The world has nothing more to do. The world looks at life, a dead person looks at life, at what can I do for me? The world, a dead person looks at love as what have you done for me lately? It's all about the lust of the flesh, the desire of the flesh. What can I get today? Because if I sit here just in my own self, I'm going to go crazy and I'm going to die. Because I can't stand what's going on inside of me. So what happens is they're always going to the external and they're looking around to see what else they can do. And that, can, that, that may come down to looking in front of a mirror and putting on as much makeup to try to make yourself look good. Why? It makes me feel good. Right? The lust of the flesh. Feel. That's what that all is. 
That's why people get into alcoholism and drugs. Because if you actually thought about drugs, that's a dumb thing to do. But it makes me feel good. The kickback, the, the problem with drugs is once you've done it the once, now it's got you and it's going to drag you down. But anyway, I mean, you all know this. <clears throat> but that's all that the world has got. And if they don't do that, because those are pretty extremes, then it's I gotta find the right mate, I gotta find the right job, I gotta get the right amount of money, I gotta live in the right community, I gotta buy the right house, I gotta have the right car, I gotta buy the right TV, I gotta watch the right program, I blah blah, on and on and on. It's always an external viewpoint of what's going on outside of you. Here's the problem. When things go bad, what are you gonna do? Can you imagine that kind of thinking when Christ comes back and he pours out his wrath on a disbelieving world, what those people are going to do. There'll be no place to hide. They, they're going to call for the rocks to fall on them, to hide them from the face of God. That's how desperate, because they're going to know what's going on. That is what the world has. If you go back to chapter 5, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. We have peace. God is not mad at you. God's not looking out for you trying to figure out what you've trusted Christ as Savior. What He's done is He's justified you freely by His grace, by Christ's finished work on the cross. You're justified. Boom, it's over. We just went through that in chapter 4, chapter 3 and 4. It's a done deal. He did it all. It's all about Him. He's not out to get you no more. You have peace. So that's the justice or the judicial part of God. The judicial part of God, God's justice has been satisfied at this point, and now he can have a positive outlook towards you. He had a negative one before. It was wrath. Right? But now when he looks at you, what does he see? When God looks at us, what does he see? Yes, because of his son. You're justified freely. And so what Paul is saying is, I'm justified, that's great. But now I have peace. What's that mean? That means when things go wrong in my life as a believer and things are going on bad around, it's not God being mad at me. How many times I've heard people say, well, God's... All the stuff that went on in Haiti years ago, God's punishing them. What? You live in the day of grace. Christ died for all men, whether they approve it or not. Here's the, whether they receive it or not, rather. God's not out pouring wrath on the world. This We've been given, and here's the problem. The religion says God's mad at you. Heck, we start off feeling God's mad at me. <laughs> My parents were more, mostly mad at me half the time, so I, you know, you know God must be mad at me too, <laughs> right? We start to be mad at ourselves. We start to become legalistic, and we start to say, but I'm a failure. Hold your hand there. Go to Colossians 2.10. Something that you have. When Christ died for you on the cross, and he did all of the work. Speaking of Christ, verse 9, Colossians 2, verse 9. For in him that is Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him. You know what complete means? Complete. <laughs> Does complete mean you're missing something? Does complete mean you've got to add something? You're complete. You see? You're complete in Christ. Why are you complete in Christ? What did we just read? Like, what did I just go over for a half an hour? He did it all. He did it all for you. You're complete. As soon as you trust Christ, he makes you complete. He 
He's not mad at you. He's not looking at you and saying you're a failure because you did this or did that. Go back, go back to the Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Actually, no, you know what? Go to, go to, we're in Colossians 2, go to verse 7. Verse 2. No. Sorry. <laughs> and while you're on your way there, no, no. When we start to understand that Christ did it all, and that we are complete in Him, and that that what he did freely was nothing of us. What happens, we start to get into what is called grace motivation. And here's all I'll explain to you. If I give you a rule under the threat of a punishment, or I give you something that you desire to do, which one is going to motivate you more? Desire. Desire to do. Desire. Right? When wrath is a motivation, what does it, what does wells up inside of us? Fear. Fear. And if I fail and I get wrath, what do I say? I'm incomplete. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. There's something wrong with me. And when there's something wrong with me, I gotta search outside of myself to figure out how to make myself desirable to myself, to others, that's what I do. But if I have grace motivation, that grace motivation is, I'm gonna give you a desire towards that, rather than I'm gonna beat you if you don't. You see? So verse seven, oh, uh, verse six. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. How did you receive Christ, by what? By the works you did? No. By trying to be good? No. How did that work for you? Bad. By faith. By faith. <laughs> <It's a bad. laughs> Rooted. Now watch. He says, walk ye in him. How am I going to walk in Christ? What's that even mean? Erica, please explain. <laughs> I don't blame you. I look at him. What? <laughs> well, there you go. That's even bad. Okay. Rooted and built up in him. And established in the what? Faith. Now he's not talking about so many people. Oh, I just believe in God. I have faith. You know, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about knowledge, something I trust <clears throat> in, something I can stand in. I can root my feet in and go. That I'm going to trust. That's my faith. I'm rooted and grounded in faith. How? And established in the faith as you have been. Taught. What? Say it out loud. Taught. Taught. There's a learning process. There is an issue of knowledge. And if I'm teaching you something, I'm te there's knowledge. There's teaching. There's doctrine. So you learn it and you stand in it. That's called standing in the faith, walking in the faith. That's what that, what's, that's what that means. Abounding therein with thanksgiving. Abounding. I love, I think it's probably the best example that I've ever heard of the description of abounding. I remember Pastor Jordan recounting this little story. I don't know if I've told you folks this one before. And if I have, I apologize, but it's funny. I'll tell you again anyway. He was preaching on the street somewhere, I don't know if it was Alabama or whatever. As a young man, he was preaching. And back then, they used to preach on the street. That doesn't go over so well nowadays. But um, he was preaching on the street. Although some guys do that, and they're quite good at it. Anyway, you're right. He's preaching on the street, and he sees this old farmer, and he says, come in. And he just, he's holding himself, and he runs into the pharmacy behind him. And he's thinking, i got to see this. So he turns around, he goes in the store, and the old farmer goes and grabs a pack of Alka-Seltzer, and down the throat he goes, and, he's, and he looks around, and he grabs a bottle of Coke, a big bottle of Coke, and he goes, oh, this is not going to go away. 
<laughs> and that old farmer drink, blah, 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 drink down that Coke, and he bursts out the door, and he said that was coming out of every orifice that he had, his eyes, his nose, his ears, everything, his mouth. He says he was abounding. <laughs> Get the visual on that now? That's abounding. That's, that's what Paul is talking about, is abounding therein with thanksgiving. I don't think those young girls understood that because Alpha Salsa would get fizzy like putting baking soda and vinegar. Oh yeah, and that's right. Yeah, yeah. Like maybe you never had that ever everything. since. I thought everybody knew what Alpha Salsa was. Coke. It's the Mentos challenge. Oh, the Mentos. Mentos. Yeah, okay. And imagine taking that with a big bottle of, of carbonated cola. I want to do that. Have you ever put the, have you ever tried that put it in a bottle? Like a pop bottle you just you just put it in the pot bottle like that, and it just explodes. But anyway, the idea there is abounding. Abounding therein with thanksgiving. Grace motivates by giving you everything up front. You have it. So many people say, well, you know, i got all kinds of problems, but when I die, you know, and I go to heaven, then it's going to be something. No. No, no, no. Back to chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified with faith, we have. By faith, we have. You see? You got it all up front. The moment you trusted Christ, that very moment, what happened to you with the Holy Spirit? Anyone know? You sealed. Bang! The very moment you were sealed, and then God said, Oh, by the way, I've given you all this now. You're a new creature. Now you have all of this stuff. You, you're not just saved here to be on earth and then go through hell on earth. That's not the point. And, and what you find out in these first 11 verses is... I've got a whole bunch of things that I was given like that. You have it. How many people say, but it's a process. I hear that, oh, but pastor, it's a process. Really? Sanctification. Can I see this? <laughs> Being justified by faith, what? I have a process to go through? I have. Peace with God. With God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Why do I have peace? Verse 6. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for who? The ungodly. the ungodly. Because Christ died for the ungodly, I've got peace. I didn't need to die. I didn't need to suffer. I didn't need to go through a whole bunch of stuff. I didn't need to go through a million self-help books to try to figure this all out. What I did was, He did it for me. Now what? Verse 8. But God commendeth his love. You know what commendeth means? You know what to commend something means? He proves it. He, he establishes it. Okay? God commendeth his love toward us. How? In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While you were yet a failure, you didn't need to do anything. While you were yet a sinner, Christ died for us. And that's the, 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 the crux of salvation that he said, you know what, you didn't need to do anything. In fact, in chapter 2, he says, if you do something, you're just going to treasure up, store wrath in the day of wrath. Verse 9. Much more than. Not only that, he goes, look, I've been, he's gone through a whole bunch of things up to verse 8. He goes, but wait, guys, there's more. Much more than. Being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. What's he talking about? Saved from hell. What? Saved from hell? Saved from nope. judgment? It's wrath. What tribulation? Tribulation? Not tribulation. Okay. Right? When Paul, when Paul talks about saved from wrath, what, 
let's it's a dispensational issue is what it is okay it's a dispensational so what happens is Israel having rejected Christ and they if they fall they diminish what are they subject to the wrath of God wrath that's the fifth that's the fifth measure of um, correction and I'm not using the term it escapes me right chastisement. now chastisement thank you uh, that's the fifth level of chastisement for Israel. Okay? They are going to go through wrath. But he says, Christ did it all. So I'm not out to get wrath on you. There's no wrath. That's peace. If I don't have to be afraid of going through the wrath, if I don't have to be afraid of one day the Antichrist is going to come and all this stuff over here in Revelation and Daniel, the book of the 70th week of Daniel, if I'm not thinking about that, what am I thinking of? P word. Peace. Because if I don't have wrath, I got peace. There's a lot of people confused about that, about whether they're going in the rapture before the wrath of God, or yeah, midway yeah. or after. And, and there's enough verses. Yeah, look, it's very simple. If you understand the purpose of the tribulation and what its purpose is, you could never come to the conclusion that a, that a person saved by grace through faith is going to go through the wrath. It doesn't fit. Right? There's a purpose to that wrath. Verse 10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled by God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We're reconciled by God. We have peace. Why? Christ died for the ungodly. He died for us while we were yet sinners, while we were weak. So many people, I heard the one guy, he said, I can't trust Christ, but I can't make a decision to trust Christ. I said, why? He says, you don't know what I've done. i got to get myself, he says, you don't understand what I've done. And i got, I got to change my ways. <laughs> he, he doesn't understand grace. There's nothing you can do to gain God's favor and justice. If you've committed the crime, you're guilty of the crime, Therefore, the crime has a penalty. The wages of sin or the penalty of sin is death. So you're done. You see? How? Here's the example. If I were to kill a man, how can I unkill him? I'm guilty. And justice says, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, life for life, right? Verse 11, and not only so, okay, we had a much more then, and now we got a not only so, he just keeps going, this guy. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received atonement. If I have atonement, if I don't have the penalty of wrath coming down on me, if I'm not worried that God's mad at me all the time, oh, what have I done, what have I done? And I'm talking to believers here, okay? This is about believers, not unbelievers, okay? So don't think this is about a non-believer we're talking about that. We're talking about if you trusted Christ as Savior, one of the things you're going to do is you're going to revert to that sin state that pre-saved pre state, and you're going to say, but I'm defective. That's going to happen. And what did Paul say in Colossians 2.10? And you're complete in him. Are you complete outside of him? Go back to Colossians 2.7. Hold your hand. We're going to come right back here. Colossians 2, 7, verse 7. I was trying to get through this, this uh, few verses a lot quicker than this, but okay. Colossians 2, 
uh, Colossians uh, 2 6. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him. I'm complete in him. And what I need to do is walk that completeness, and I need to be rooted and built up in him. You know what that means? You think that means I like growing roots to the floor or something? Or what's that even mean? I'm rooted and built up in him. At, yes, as ye have been taught. There's a knowledge issue. You see, the issue is if you're not taught, if you're not studying, remember 2 Timothy 2.15, what's it say? Say, say it out loud. Study to show thyself approved unto God. There's a knowledge issue that you need to get. We have so many churches today where believers are going in and they're being fed a line, fed a line, but they're not being taught. They're not being rooted and grounded. And what happens is you start to believe your income. And if I understand that I'm complete, and if all of you understand you're complete, and then you live that out in your life, what's the other believer going to do when he sees you? He's going to start to understand. Watch a show one time, the guy's a believer, and he's on that show, you know, the, the hoarders thing there? Or the, <clears throat> you ever watch that? That's so disgusting. Oh, and then <laughs> so disgusting. But, 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 but I'm watching I'm going, how did you get to that point that you are so, are, you're so uh, obsessed with material that you can't even let go of your garbage? You're so obsessed with material, you can't even let go of your feces. I mean, this is bad. It is. You know? It, when you start to go down the road where you're incomplete and you don't understand who you are in Christ and who Christ has made you, those things start to happen. You start to exhibit. Now the world's got no choice. See? So they come up with systems, human viewpoint systems, and it changes all the time. And you listen to the latest psychiatrist and, and, the, and the latest book and the latest doctor so-and-so and, and the latest guy that writes this book about how you're going to have eternal happiness. If you just follow this and buy my book, he's happy. He got the money. <laughs> He's happy. And you go down all those roads, how many self-help books do you go through? Well, the, the first, it, it has an effect, because the self-help, you go through that, yeah, oh yeah, it, it worked. And then six months later, you're back to your old miserable self. Right? Because if you're dead in trespasses and sins, you have no hope. You don't have peace. You're left with the wrath of God abiding on you. So I'm just going through my, uh, my notes here, and I, and, I, and I have it in my head, so I jump ahead, okay? <laughs> I've done all of that stuff. Okay, so um, chapter 5, what chapter 5 does is it deals with our eternal security. So the issue is we've learned that all of sin comes short of the glory of God. We've learned that there's nothing you can do, no matter how religious, no matter how good you are, no matter if you are a Jew, you're a descendant of Abraham, you know, it doesn't matter what those things you do, Christ paid it all. Now, because the fact that Christ paid it all, he did it, and you stood on it because you trusted it, you believed in it, and you said, listen, Lord, I can't do this, but I believe you have. And I'm just going to rest in that. Because of who you are in Christ, you now have eternal security. That means you can't lose it. Right? I have peace. Remember, down here we see um, verse 8. 
uh, chapter 5, verse 8. But God commendeth, he proves, he, he, he established his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He said, you didn't have to become good. You didn't have to do anything. While you were a total mess, wreck, useless, that's when I died for you. And because of that, and because of what Christ has done, we now, on a judicial level, have a settled account. It's settled. You need to meditate on that. A lot of people will acknowledge, yeah, 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 yeah. But they, they don't realize what Christ bought, what he did for you. You need to, met, to, to meditate on that. Verse 2. Verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into his grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We have access to God before when you were a non-believer, your prayers went about how high? From your lips. But hit that ceiling, that was it. You say, well, I don't understand. I've been praying and <laughs> no one's answering me. You see, if you're dead in trespasses and sins, and it's the Holy Spirit that gives you life, and only then can your spirit communicate with God's spirit, right? See, th there's a concept in Scripture about spirits, and the concept is you got a dog. You can't communicate and understand what that dog's going through, can you? You might think you can, because, hey, uh, Rex, come Rex, he's in the tail of his wagon, right? He's just, oh, okay, I'm, I'm just happy, right? And you can tell him he can roll over, and he's learned little tricks, but you you can't sit here and go, hey, Rex, did you know that therefore being justified with faith being <laughs> peace of God? It doesn't. Not really. He can't communicate with your spirit. Some people are all upset. No, you don't understand. Them. My dog, my best friend, and we, you know, we have a... No, 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 no. He can't. He's, he's a dog. Your hamster can't. Your dog can't. My cats can't. Okay? But a man, a man's spirit can understand another man's spirit. <clears throat> we can communicate and we can understand. Now, if I'm dead in trespasses and sins, how can my spirit communicate with God? See the problem there? So when I, there is a, a supernatural thing that happens when I trust in Christ's finished work on the cross, the Holy Spirit comes down, boom, he seals me, and all of a sudden I can have communication with God. Now he hears my prayer. But you didn't need to get that before he died. He said, yeah, but I, I knew that was a problem. He says, I knew you were dead. And while you were weak and dead and just lying on the ground, I died for you. When you were the worst human being that you could think on the planet, when you were doing the worst things that you could imagine, the stuff that human beings would, you know, if they found out... <laughs> They would, they would be horrified or kill you over. I died for you then. See? And that Holy Spirit, when that, when that happens, that Holy Spirit, now he comes, he seals you, now you can have a communication with God for the first time. But before then, you were dead in trespasses and sin. So you're like a zombie. Who likes zombie movies? I love zombie movies. <laughs> you, you're dead. You know the zombie, uh, they have one thing in mind. I gotta eat. And that's what a a person who is dead in trespasses and sins, all they do is I gotta feed my flesh whatever I desire. This is how I gain happiness. This is how I get joy. This is how and they have that same kind of attitude. You see? They're dead. Now you can be as a believer, you can be spiritually dead. 
You can be, or I'm sorry, functionally dead, not spiritually dead. It's not possible. Correction. You can be functionally dead, though. What if you're not growing as you've been taught? What if you are saved, okay, Christ did it all for me, right? He went on the cross. He did it all. I just trusted him. I'm done. He's got my back. All right? But then I live as wicked as somebody else. Do I deserve to lose my salvation at that point? Now, watch the way I ask that. Do I deserve? Yes, I deserve it. But did I? No. Why? Huh? Because the love of God will pass and you have been complete in Christ. Well, Justified. more specifically, because Christ paid for it. I didn't have nothing to do with it. Yeah. I never gained it. How can I lose it? He did it. If I lost my salvation, what would that say about his, his sacrifice on the cross? Doesn't well, it wasn't worth anything. <laughs> That's the problem there. And the other problem, you get, you get folks who say, yeah, I know, you know, Christ died for you, saved by grace through faith, but... You gotta live now. You know, you're not really very holy. You should be baptized, water baptized, because that'll make you better. You should, uh, you know, come to church every Sunday. You should, uh, you know, hang around and do this, do that. They have a whole criteria, and the idea is, well, you can maybe lose your salvation. But what Paul says is that is impossible. You're securing Christ. He did it all. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have. By whom we also have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. The issue of rejoicing in hope just to explain that is, as soon as you were saved, Christ said, I have blessed you in heavenly places. Remember Ephesians? You've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. What would Ephesians chapter 1? Ephesians 1. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Do you notice the word hath there? Who hath? It doesn't say who will. What tense is that? Past tense. Past tense. See, the moment you were saved, he said, here it is, boom. So now I have a hope, and I rejoice in that hope, because it's far more, uh, far more than just, well, I've, now I've got Christ, I'm going to die, and when I die, I'll go to heaven. That's, no, 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 he says, you can start living it right this moment. I've given it to you, boom, you have everything now. And not only so, verse 3, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. <laughs> Who here has been glorying in the tribulations? Who's been happy about getting into trouble? You've been happy? Is that? No, that's not a hand. You just scratch your hands. We're going to need to talk, child. <laughs> Paul's not saying here well now that you're saved you can be happy with every problem that comes along that's not what he's saying what he's saying well not in that way anyway what he's saying is not only so but we glory in tribulations also knowing that tribulation worketh patience God didn't save you here and said well I'm just going to let you live in hell on earth here. And you know when you get to heaven then, then I'll give it to you. He did much more. What he did is he gave us the mechanism and the tools by which to, to run out of time real quick, by which to deal with life on earth right now. Turn to uh, James chapter 2. There's something that tribulation does 
to a person. And I'll, I'm going to end off here. The gospel equips us to deal with this life. And we're going to go into it next week. But let's take a look here. Um, where am I here? Kind of jumping a little bit ahead. But anyhow, I want to go there. Start James chapter 2. Um, okay, let's start at verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. You notice that? He goes, count it all joy when you dive into temptations. Most people go, no, no, Lord, I don't want any temptations. Where are you? Where right? are you? James chapter 1, verse 2. I'm sorry. I meant chapter 1. You didn't know what I meant? No. Right. <laughs> James chapter 1. There was a 2 in there. Um, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. patience. But let patience have her perfect work. That, she, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. You notice that process James is talking about there? He says patience is going to do something for you. It's going to perfect you, you see? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask, it, ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Okay? When we're going through things... That you've been given by grace, you've been given, yes, what? Why does it say her? Where? In her four. perfect work in four. Yeah, patience is a female, didn't you know that? <laughs> no. <laughs> it never uses her in the Bible, really. Yeah. For wisdom, they also use her. Yeah, that, that's true. For wisdom, they use her. Yeah. 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 But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask it of God. If you lack wisdom, what do you do? Ask, ask God. Where are you going to find the, the, the information for how you operate in the day of grace? I'm going to ask God, and now, God, I need wisdom. Where am I going to go? Romans 12, Ephesians 4, Colossians 3. You can write that down. If any of you lack wisdom, let it ask of God that giveth all, to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. When you ask God for uh, in faith, don't take your mind, well, you know, I've been asking and I, I, I'm not getting it. When you, st when you start studying this word, trust it in faith. Keep going at it. Keep reading it until you find your it is in there. Okay? Romans chapter 12, Ephesians chapter 4, and Colossians 3 will address, will address every issue you'd ever run through in your life. Did you get that? No. Romans 4, Ephesians, or I'm sorry, Romans 12, Ephesians 4, and Colossians 3. Hold your hand there and go to Philippians chapter 4 for a second. Philippians chapter 4. So hold your hand there. We're going, we're going to go back. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Here's your cure for, dis, for depression. I'm going to give you the cure for depression. This is the inoculation. You have these four verses from 48. You're not going to be, ever be depressed. Be impossible. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation, your self-control, your temperance be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. That is to be full of care. Don't be anxious. Don't be afraid. Don't be worrying for anything. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And you know what's going to happen? And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, it is mind-blowing, shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, and here's, here, this is so important, 
if all of this is done and you've been given all this and you're complete, do you know how you're supposed to look at your daily life? Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. So the next time you get all caught up of, oh, I've got to worry about this, what are you going to do? No, that's not the way I'm supposed to think. I'm going to think of what's lovely, what's good, things that rejoice. Back to James. Back to James. Okay, verse 7. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You know what a double-minded man is? Anyone take a guess what a double-minded man is? He wavers. He thinks one way one second, then he thinks the opposite the next. He, he says one thing, but he does another. <laughs> a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Uh, so you see an unstable person? Well, there you go. You got a double-minded person, okay? Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that which that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass. Uh, keep going. Uh, verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. The issue of walking in your life here, the, the application you can take from here, is that what happens with temptation is that you say, No. Why do you say no? Because that's not who I am in Christ. That's not what I do anymore. I used to, but I don't anymore. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. It's not God that is tempting you. It's not God that's trying you. It's life. God is not sitting there and going, okay, I'm going to throw a whole bunch of things Robert's way so that, you know, I can get him to smarten up. That's not how he works. Well, how he, what's going on is you're saved, you're complete in Christ, you're saved by the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It's complete, it's done, and then he's, but you're in this earth, and what's going to happen? Things are going to happen. So don't sit there and go, well, I wonder what happened, I wonder what God's trying to tell me. That's not what's going on. Life is happening. But what God is saying is, I've given you everything to be able to deal with it. Being rooted and grounded in Him is being able to deal with all those things. Go back to chapter 5, and we're going to finish off. Go back to chapter 5, Romans. I was going to go through. You can read the rest of that chapter. It's quite interesting. Uh, of how temptation is, it works and how it's supposed to work. And you're not to look at temptation, A, as a wrath thing, B, as God trying to get you to change your ways. What you're looking at is, you know how a diamond is, perform is, is, is made? By pressure. You will only grow when you're put under pressure and you go through it. And this is the problem with people who turn to self-medicating themselves and they say, I don't know what's going on, I can't handle life. Because what happens is anytime the temptation comes along, they don't trust on God's word and they self-medicate, they get drunk and then problems get worse. As they will do, right? And then they go, I can't handle my life. I'm incomplete. There's something wrong with me. But God says, I've given you all. I've done it for you. And he said, not, verse 3, not only so, but we glory in tribulations. He, I, I glory in tribulation because I know that tribulation worketh patience. If he's done it all up here, he's put me in heavenly places, and I'm going through things here, what's my mindset to be? But it's okay. In the end, we win. Amen. That's the point. You see, you start, and remember what Philippians 4, 8 says, if it's lovely, it's a good report, think on those things. Let's close the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for uh, dying for us and, and doing it all for us. And we ask that you would help us to 
trust you not only for our salvation but our daily life and that we um, that we study your word and we, we grow in, in the knowledge of grace uh, so that we can deal with these things in life that you've given us all the ability to deal with. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Paul, it's been shared to you. I know that in a song.